coming up, an interview with one of the greatest drummers in rock and roll history on two number one hits that put this band on the map. The first song is a candidate for the most atmospheric hit of its time, truly. And it came to the singer when he was sloppy drunk. He said he came up with a worst song title ever for it, so he changed it up when he was sober, and it somehow ended up being an even worse title. The second song is one of the most played in rock history, and the drummer says he has one big regret about it decades later. Get the story of two classic number one hits and our exclusive interview next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you ever videotaped episodes of Headbangers Ball or 120 Minutes back in the day when MTV actually played music, when it actually rocked, uh, you're going to dig this channel of deep musical nostalgia. Make sure to subscribe right now. Click the big red button and click the bell so you always know when our stuff's coming out. Also, check us out on Patreon. So I'm excited to bring you yet another episode from our series, Revelations, my favorite. This is where featured artists take us for a deep dive and explore the greatest songs and their greatest albums, insight you truly won't find anywhere else. Today, we got another great interview with one of the greatest drummers from rock and roll history, one of my favorites. Another fun conversation with the backbeat behind the legendary rock trio, The Police. Talking about Mr. Stuart Copeland who along with bassist singer Sting and guitarist Andy Summer put out five of the finest albums of their time. Alanis de Amor, Regatta de Blanc, Zenyatta Mandata, Ghost in the Machine, and Synchronicity. Today, we're going back to 1979 to their sophomore record, Regatta de Blanc. We're going to talk about the album's key tracks, including a song that is a true candidate for the most atmospheric song of the 70s. I'm talking about Walking on the Moon. With its dark bass undertones and its skipping hi-hat, this song is a mind better for sure. Sting actually created the song when he was three sheets to the wind. Uh, he was sloppy drunk one night after getting sloshed with a composer friend in Munich. And he came back to the hotel, barely able to get into bed. I guess he was slumped up against the wall and the riff came into his head. So apparently he got up and he was walking, really teetering around the room trying to concentrate, and he started muttering exactly what he was doing. He started singing, walking around the room, walking around the room. Luckily, the next morning, he remembered the riff. He also remembered the song lyrics, and uh, he actually wrote it down. But he felt that walking around the room was a stupid title for a song, so he changed it to walking on the moon. And actually, Sting feels that he came up with an even worse title than the first one with walking on the moon. So the song is set in space, but it's an allegory for how Sting felt when he was on the road, or how the band felt, confined to hotel rooms and stages as the world kept turning. Further, in his autobiography, Sting implies that the song was partially inspired by an early girlfriend. He said, and I quote, Deborah Anderson was my first real girlfriend. Walking back from Deborah's house in those early days would eventually become a song, for being in love is to be relieved of gravity. So that was likely in his head as well. The song was originally recorded as a straight-ahead rocker, but in the end, they reworked it. Walking on the Moon it was released as the follow-up single to the band's first number one hit in the UK, the classic rock standard message in a bottle in late 1979. Stuart Copeland talks about both songs next, and he talks about the one big regret he had with his performance on Message in a Bottle all these years later. He also talks about the album track, Contact, which is truly one of the strangest police songs ever, and I mean that in the best way. I come on over, but I haven't got a way. The police always had so many cool album titles, and up next, Stewart also explains where they all came from. He also tells a hilarious story about his friend Neil Peart from the other legendary rock trio, Rush. This one is a can't miss. As I get into this interview, I do want to thank our sponsor, Zenny. I wear the glasses I always wear. Zenny actually tops the charts in customer service. Zenny was recently named the Newsweek's list of America's best customer service for uh, the fifth consecutive year. This is based on an independent survey of more than 30,000 U.S. customers. I'm telling you, go design your own look. Click on our info button here to get amazing prices on prescription glasses. 
up to 80% off regular retail prices. Here's Stuart Copeland with the story of two number one hits, Message in a Bottle and Walking on the Moon. We regard you here at Professor Rock as one of the five best drummers of the rock era, uh, along with John Bonham and uh, Keith Moon and Neil Peart and Ginger Baker. But that's my top five. And one of the great things you have in common with all those guys is fearlessness, I think. Hang on, let's not get carried away there. Fearlessness is a guy who does uh, skateboarding tricks for a living. <laughs> Banging drums does not take any great bravery. Um, <laughs> uh, takes a lot of maybe arrogance, uh, but bravery, physical bravery. Uh, thank you for that compliment. Um, but nobody dies. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Well, jumping into Regatta de Blanc, 1979, went to number one in the UK, the album. You guys upgraded from a 16-track to a 24-track machine, you know, looking at the production notes. Got to ask you about Walking on the Moon, one of the most atmospheric songs of that time, even though there's no atmosphere on the moon. <laughs> yeah. But it's got one of the greatest intros of the time as well. Simple bass line and that dancing, skipping hi-hat. Tell me about that. Well, the skipping hi-hat used a device called a delay line or a repeat echo. And that was something that the dub cats would use in um, dub reggae, which was... Uh, there's a backstory to that, which was that in the punk clubs, um, even punks high on glue got a chill sometimes. But there's no such thing as chill punk music. It just uh, it's just a, it's an oxymoron cannot exist. Um, so what the DJs would do is play hostile dub reggae, which was uh, chill, but still suitably hostile. Uh, but it was very moody and dark. And the tricks that they would play was that they would cut out tracks and have echo repeat. Yeah, that, 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 that. And so there was a whole world of playing with repeats, re with the echo, the slapback. And um, I figured out a technique where I could have just one hit, da, da. So I hit the drum once and go, da, and then there's a repeat, da, da. Or if I go, da, da. Da, 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 da. And then I can build up a rhythm using the slapback, using that repeat and playing against the repeat. And every time I play with the repeat, it's like a dog barking at itself in the mirror. Uh, I'm, forgive me, playing with myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's, and there's some of that on Regatta de Blanc, the track. I used it. That was one of my favorite toys for a while. I used it a lot on stage. I could click that repeat on. Uh, either on the kick, oomchu, 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 or on the snare, usually on the snare, or the hi-hat. And so all that fancy hi-hat stuff, and at the end, that's all me playing against the repeat. I remember the engineer turning around and said, Stuart, this, this is going to put you on the map, this track. <laughs> and I didn't know what he was talking about because I wasn't hitting every drum in sight and going hey, crazy. And I thought that was way too subtle to launch me into, um, you know, into everybody's faces. Uh, but he was right. A lot of people talk about that. It's mesmerizing. That's the part of the song that I love most. The interesting thing is when you see, when I see a cover band playing that song, and the guy live is playing all of it. He's playing the original and the repeat. And uh, kids these days, I don't know what they're feeding, but they can do that. <laughs> Very cool. As a three-piece, it felt like you never forced it or tried to sound bigger than you were. You used that limitation as an advantage. Well, it was space. It was space. There's room for each one of us to be King Kong in our own little third of the uh, audioscape. I don't know all the technicalities of drumming, but I know that I've never before or since heard creativity and adventure in in drumming like that in, in that particular song. Well, I, I'll tell you where you can look. I can tell you where to look. 
Where's that? Ringo Starr. Oh, yeah. Ringo Starr did not play what the drummer in the Kinks, the drummer in the Stones, the drummer in the every other band, which is basically a 4-4 backbeat. Ringo used his tom-toms, hit, you know, he just had complete, and he didn't get credit because he didn't go brrrr, he didn't go hitting every drum sight. He hit his drums very infrequently, in fact, but his choice of what he did do wasn't technically hard to play, it was very imaginative and different. And that was, you know, so I'm not the first guy to turn the drums backwards. I, we got to give it up for Ringo on that one. Yeah. Well, message in a bottle, your fills and accents are invaluable modules made that so distinctive. Tell me about your approach to message in a bottle when you first heard it. You guys had to know this is a hit, even though it took a while. Oh, yeah. Well, that guitar figure, Sting's, Sting's a heck of a guitar player, by the way. And that dear little lady, little lady, little lady that is so Sting. And uh, he had that, and then he came up with a, with a harmony for it as well. And Andy, had Andy play the original part, plus a harmony on top of it, I think a third above or something like that. And um, so the riff was an instant killer. Once again, I don't know what he's singing about. I'm just banging shit at the back of the stage. All I ever see is the back of his head. Uh, so he was singing something cool, no doubt. But it was that riff that got me going. Me but speaking of Andy, uh, he deserted me. In my hour of need. Uh, he was quality control. He was bullshit detector. And uh, anything that was on, you know, his his favorite expression was less is more. And uh, <laughs> so he he was the, kind of the disciplinarian in, in that regard. But he must have gone out to the swimming pool or been playing Space Invaders or something when I did those overdubs at the end of Message in a Bottle. Where I added a snare and um, cymbal on top of a perfectly good rhythm because Sting did used to like to dr sing those end choruses forever and ever and ever. And to just keep something going on there, I added some overdubs that I now regret half a century later. And I, I, I lament that where was Andy when I needed him to say, no, 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 that's too much. Less is more. Uh, so now, really great record. I'm really proud of it. Uh, if it weren't for those damn drum fills at the end. <laughs> yeah, well, we always look back and regret on something, so. Yeah. But Contact, I love Contact as an album track. It's always been one of my favorites. It's a very strange song. Have we got touched on? Can we be? Tell me about that. Well, it's um, by that time, I think I had more advanced. We, you know, we eventually, all three of us ended up with full, full blown recording studios in our homes. So we would come to the next recording session not with an idea for a song, but with a fully recorded platinum demo. Um, and that I figured out keyboard, I just I figured out all the components of it. I've still got my demos, which will probably appear on the deluxe version of that album. And the lyric is all about connection, you know. We, you know, the loneliest place in the world in my experience, is New York City. You know, surrounded by teeming millions, but I haven't got any of their phone numbers. I'm stuck in a hotel room with nobody to call, surrounded by humanity. And how do you make connection? I come on over, but I haven't got a way to go. That's always been, I'm sure, everybody's problem. How do you, how do you make connections? My good connection on the telephone never lies. 
Well, you guys always had these off the wall album titles, right? Let's talk about Zenyatta Mandata from uh, 1980. We always wondered if we were saying it correctly. Oh, uh, well, you're saying that one correctly. The first one, uh, and the first two are always mispronounced. Outlando's Damor, period. Damor, and it's, I usually hear it as De Amor, which there's D apostrophe, which means it's Damor. Um, regatta de Blanc, um, it could be Regatta de Blanc in English, but since it's got that C at the end, that makes it kind of fr- a little bit Frenchish. Uh, yeah, I always said Regatta again, de Blanc. That's how I always how I heard it said. But we can go with that. We can go with that. That's <laughs> fine. Regatta. Uh, what the next one? Zenyatta Mondada. No problem with that. That's easy. Uh, but okay, the source of those three album titles was my brother Miles, who by this time was our manager, and he did have a knack for coming up with great album title uh, album names, which is the bane of any group. You record your album. Okay, what are we going to call the album? Right. You know, Inner Mounting Flame. You know. Uh, uh, mountains of desire, uh, songs of the bullshit, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so Miles did come up with these ingenious names for the, for the albums. You know, Zenyatta Mondata. Uh, Sting was very philosophical. That's the Zen part. Zenyatta uh, rhymes with Kenyatta, uh, who is a, uh, an African uh, leader, uh, one of the first African leaders to bust out of the colonial system. And uh, Mondata reflects the fact that we were touring the world and we consider ourselves a very global band. Um, And so those are the elements that I'm speaking for Miles here went into his inspiration for that name. After that, Sting took over. (laughs) And it's sort of like in the early days, I've, I've, I've got my book out, which is my diaries of 77, 78, the starving years. And I've got in it, you can see all my notes, how much we got paid for the gigs and, and, uh, and the set lists. And the set lists are kind of brief, these crap songs, most of which you haven't heard of. But at a certain point, the set lists are in Sting's handwriting. <laughs> and uh, for others, for, you know, for some people, that might seem as an intrusion into my band. But I'm a youngest sibling. And for me, for Sting to be writing the set list means he gives a shit about the band that I built. And now he's identifying with it. He's contributing. He's bringing in songs. That's a good day for me to have, you know, because look what happened when he started writing. As soon as Andy joined the band and Sting started, you know, look, look at all the great things that happened as a result of that. Uh, so even though he's taken over the band, starting with the set list, uh, I'm a happy guy. Yeah, I think... All these years later, there are two trios that people are, I mean, that were appreciated in his time, but I think that they're definitely looking inside of your music and each, what each member brought to it in The Police and in Rush. Well, Rush, you know, Neil was a good friend of mine. And uh, in spite of the fact that one of the indignities of being me, one that I have to deal with is, you know, walking down, you know, whistling a happy tune and somebody comes up, oh, wow, Stuart Cope, my God, my God, you're my f- second favorite drummer. <laughs> and I know it's Neil. It's always Neil. <laughs> I love that. That's funny. Man, Stuart's so cool. So interestingly enough, the band Walk the Moon, who had a big rock hit a few years back with Shut Up and Dance With Me, they lifted their band name from this haunting police track, Walking on the Moon. I also want to mention that Stuart Copeland has a new book out right now. You should get it. It's called The Police Diaries. It's his personal diary of life uh, in this band, in the police during the early days Uh, Click on the link below to get your copy. Thanks so much for watching. Leave us a comment about the police and walking on the moon and message in a bottle. What are your memories of these classic tracks? Also the story about Neil Peart. Who are your, who do you think are the greatest drummers of all time? Definitely Stuart's in there. Let's have a great discussion below about this trio, about Stuart, about the police. If you like our content, we invite you to subscribe below. We would love to have you as part of our community. Until next time, records. And the truth, my friend.